Hello and welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of New Food and Camphill, I'd like to say thank you so much for attending. I'm your moderator and I'm Anna Lambert, editor of New Food. So today's great lineup of speakers. We've got uh, Patrick Janssen, Global Business Development Manager, Air Cleaner. We've got Ross Dummigan, Food and Beverage Segment Manager at Camphill, and Cassie Marsh, Director at Technique Consulting. Uh, following presentations from these three, we will move on to a live question and answer session where you can pose questions to today's speakers. Please remember, you can submit questions at any point during the webinar using the Ask a Question panel situated below the player. So uh, without further ado, can I pass you over to today's keynote speakers, Patrick Janssen, Ross Dummigan, and Cassie Marsh. Thank you for the introduction, Anna. My name is Patrick Janssen. My name is Ross Dummigan. And I'm Cassie Marsh. So the agenda for today is clean air, the vital ingredient to food and beverage manufacturing. The importance of indoor air quality, food and beverage industry standards for indoor air quality. How is air introduced to a facility? Reducing mold levels in your facility, protecting your facility from cross-contamination, upgrading your facility, monitoring and controlling your air quality. And then we'll end up with question and answers. Importance of air quality. Indoor air quality refers to the quality of the air inside buildings as represented by concentration or pollutants of thermal conditions that affect the health, comfort and performance of occupants. Indoor air quality in food and beverage facilities should protect the product, customer, people and processes Poor indoor air quality can lead to outbreaks or cross-contamination of product or areas. Airborne particles can affect the food you eat, the liquid you drink, the air you breathe. Every day you eat one kilo of food. And every day you drink two to three kilo of liquid. Every day you breathe 15 kilo of air. In this picture from Lennart Nilsson shows the alveola in the respiratory system and you can see cluster of nanoparticles on organic materials in the alveoli showed as yellow. Photoplankton is the savior for us humans. It produces nearly 75% of all oxygen on earth living on the ocean surface. We breathe about 15 kilo of air daily. The alveoli surface is 70 square meters, and we have 700 million alveoli within our body. More than 25 million particles we inhale with each breath. Particles in dust have to be around 40 to 50 microns to be visible to a human eye. Some of you already know the magnitude of size of a human down to a virus, but let us look at a short film here. First, you could see the epithelial level on the surface of the skin, and then down to a bacteria, and further down to the size of a virus. and you end up in 100 nanometers, or 10 nanometers, or one nanometer. PM definition, particle matter. If you start with PM10, is a mass concentration of particles with an aerodynamic diameter less than 10 microns expressed in micrograms per cubic meters. PM2.5, Mass concentration of particles, aerodynamic diameter less than 2.5 microns expressed in micrograms per cubic meters. PM1, mass concentration of particles with an aerodynamic diameter less than 
one microns expressed in micrograms per cubic meters. If we talk about the difference between PM1, PM2.5, and PM10, PM2.5 and PM10 particle moves mostly with the wind, mainly from sources far away. PM1 is often locally based and generated from diesel and other combustions. PM1 is 75 to 80 percent of all mass weight up to PM2.5. This is why it's important to measure PM1. PM1 correlates with ultra fine particles or nanoparticles. PM1 and NO2 often come from the same source and the values correlate. This diagram so shows the particle size of airborne pollutants, viruses, bacteria, and spores. What we don't want to get in contact with food is salmonella, which is about 0.5 microns to 1.5 mic microns. Listeria is about 0.2 microns to 6 microns. E. coli is about 0.2 to 1 microns in size. As you heard through the presentation, the most harmful particles are the ones we cannot see. Now we'll pass on to Cassie Marsh from Technique Consulting to talk about the food and beverage manufacturing standards. Thank you, Patrick. Hi, everybody. My name's Cassie Marsh, and I'm the director of Technique Consulting Limited. Um, and I specialise in meeting the GFSI and UK retailer standards. Before we go into the actual standards themselves, I just, just thought I'd explain a little bit about what we do at Technic A. So we provide expert advice and training to the food and drink industry to help manufacturers meet the GFSI and retailer standards. But the most important thing that we do here is something that we call Technic A Smart Knowledge. So Technic A Smart Knowledge is a fortnightly blog, which is written by me, um, and it's written for techies. So it provides free advice all about uh, technical standards. If you would like to join up um, and become one of our techies, you can do so on our homepage of our website, which is technica.co.uk. Or if you would like to look at the previous Smart Knowledge uh, articles that we've published, you can do that on technica.co.uk forward slash news. Okay, so I'm going to run through what the standards say with regard to air filtration. Um, and to do this, we'll look at the BRC and then we'll take a couple of examples of retailer standards. So let's start with BRC. BRC is one of the most comprehensive standards, I believe, out of the GFSI recognized schemes, but it still only has one clause on air quality, which is 4413. So it says, high risk areas shall be supplied with sufficient changes of filtered air. The filter specification used and the frequency of the air changes shall be documented. This shall be based on a risk assessment, taking into account the sources of the air and the requirements to maintain positive air pressure to the relative surroundings. So let's break that down. So first of all, it talks about high risk areas. So we don't need to consider low risk at this stage. And for this reason, we must presume that the clause's intention is to prevent pathogenic contamination over any other type of contamination. The next point is that it refers to the filter specification and that it must be documented. So what filter size do we use? Well, it doesn't say and if we actually look in the interpretation guide, that doesn't actually help as much either, because all that says is there is no absolute standard for filters, which is a bit odd in my personal opinion, because I think that if you're producing products in a high risk area, it doesn't matter whether it's sandwiches or salads or anything else, it has to meet the same standard. So it would be really useful in my mind if they actually specified what air filter size they actually wanted. But what it does say 
is that we have to use a risk assessment to determine what that filter specification size should be. And it also states that whatever filtration system we apply, we must maintain positive air pressure. So you can't do one or the other, you have to be able to control both. So let's see if the retailer standards give us any more information. So here's the Tesco standard, um, and that reiterates the fact that we need a risk assessment. So it says a documented risk assessment must be conducted to determine the requirements for air filtration. Note that the clause says medium. So what that means is that it has to be applied wherever the product is open and it adheres to both low risk and high risk product. The next clause in the Tesco standard talks mainly about positive air pressure, but it also goes on to say that in the uh, what good looks like section that we need to use an F7 grade filter or equivalent as a very minimum. However, F7 on its own isn't sufficient and I'll explain why later. So let's look at M&S, as they're normally really good uh, at providing us with a detailed explanation of what we need to do. So they say that we need to have adequate ventilation of clean air to be provided into the factory to prevent contamination. They also go on um, to talk about air handling systems, which is a new element with regard to what was stated in the BRC standard, but it's a really important point because we need to make sure that we maintain the system and keep it clean because otherwise we can have the best filters in there, but if we don't look after it, then a dirty system is going to produce unclean air. The third section uh, talks about the fact that we need a hygienic design and access, and that reiterates the fact that we need to maintain and keep the system clean. Here, M&S uh, are saying that when we know what filter we're going to put in, we need to make sure that it's installed correctly um, to make sure it doesn't leak. They also go on to specify where exactly the filter should be. And then they say what the pre-filter should be as a minimum. So here they see, say G4, but they don't actually say what the uh, final filter should be. So to summarize, the standards say that we have to have filtration as a minimum for high risk areas, but unfortunately they don't tell us what exact filter we need to do, use to do this. They just say that we need to create a risk assessment to work out what the filter size should be, and we need to make sure that we keep the system clean. And when we say clean, we need to prove that it's clean, so that would require monitoring of air plates, for example. And all the while, we've got to maintain positive air pressure. So let's look at the risk assessment in a little bit more detail, because it's OK to say do one, but how? What do we do? Well, let's remind ourselves of what we're trying to achieve. First of all, we're trying to prevent airborne contamination. And we're interested in doing this mainly for high risk areas. And we want to do this because we want to prevent pathogenic contamination of high-risk products, which can support pathogenic growth. So if we put that into a statement, uh, we can say that we want to create a risk assessment that defines the filter size, which will remove pathogenic bacteria. So to do this, we need to know what the size of patho pathogenic bacteria are. So you can see here that the, they vary slightly, but the smallest would be 0.2 micron. So we need a filter that removes pathogenic bacteria that are 0.2 micron. Well, that's a million dollar question as what filter size does that? Well, I'm going to cut to the chase and go straight to the answer. So we need a HEPA H13 filter as this will remove down to or below 0.15 micron. So before I pass you on to Ross, I mentioned at the beginning we write a fortnightly blog called Technique Smart Knowledge. 
We published a smart knowledge in January on how to carry out a detailed risk assessment to determine your air filter size. So I've given you the answer of what filter you need for high risk, but this blog gives you loads of detail about how we came to that conclusion. I've also taken that information and I've put it into a Word document as a risk assessment, which you can download and then adapt and use as your own if you would like to. So if you'd like a copy, uh, just follow the link that's shown on the screen to technica.co.uk forward slash high risk air filters and you can sign up to the smart knowledge. You'll then get a welcoming email with a link to our free downloads page where you can download the risk assessment and loads of other really useful documentation too. Right, I'll pass you back on to Ross now. Thank you, Cathy. Hello everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. My name is Ross Dumbigan. I'm the Food and Beverage Segment Manager for Cantal. What we're going to show you here is how air enters your facility through an air handling unit. This is a schematic drawing of the HVAC unit and its air movement. As you can see with the arrow one, air is coming from the outdoor area and it is untreated. Air is being filtered through the classified filter in one, set, in one or several filter steps, as we can see in arrow two. In arrow three, air passing through a heat exchanger. In arrow four, air supplied to the room. In arrow five, air exhausting from the room. In six, exhaust air is, is being filtered through a classified filter in one or more or several filter steps. At point seven, air passing through a heat exchanger at point eight is filtered through the heat exchanger and returned air to outdoor air. When you look at an air handling unit, there are several items that we should be inspected and confirmed and maintained. As we can see from the, the pictures in this slide, fan belts and bearings, droplet separators, and doors should all be inspected to ensure that they are in working order and do not pose any risk to a facility. We can see the effects of poorly maintained air handling units in some of these pictures. From what we can see on the gaskets, especially in the, in the picture on the right hand side, the top right hand side, gaskets are not supple and they're in poor quality. Air in effect, in effect bypasses and does not get filtered. High moisture can cause corroding and exacerbate issues within an air handling unit. Dust buildup also happens and can be seen in the pictures within the production areas. And these are some of the negative impacts of poor maintenance within an air handling unit. So in the middle of 2017, a new global air filtration standard has come into play. It is called ISO 16890. And on the next slide, we will explain it a bit more. ISO 16890 is a, new, is a new standard for testing comfort filters. It's a huge filtration difference between EPM 2.5 and EPM 1, even if the efficiency percentages look the same. In the picture, you can see a correlation between PM size particles, but to put this into context, if a 10 micron particle would have the same size as a sperm whale, then an elephant would be equal to 2.5 and a human would be equal to 1 micron. So how far the different particle sizes are, are able to get into the human body? Let's take a look at this. So particles greater than 10 microns would be stopped in our nasal hair and our throats. Particles smaller than 2.5 could reach our lungs and smaller than one micron could penetrate our alveoles and into our central bloodstream, which is ultimately absorbed in our heart. So how to choose filters according to the new standard? The new standard ISO 16798-3 sets the need for filters according to the outdoor pollutants. 
it's the new standard to have the right particles and gas filters in air handling units, depending on the outdoor air pollution. Use the standard matrix to see what filters are required depending on the pollution outside. In the matrix, we have different types of outdoor air quality and different supply air filtration recommendations depending on the desired indoor air quality. This shows both particle and molecular filter needs. If you are in any way, if you are in any doubt, please contact your local camper representative and they can evaluate this for you. So now let's take a look at the way the air enters the food and beverage plant. This animation shows the, the air in a food and beverage plant. The air goes through pre-filters, fine filters, along the duct, and, in, and if in place, HEPA filters. This example shows how an extract and a HVAC system air leaves the food and beverage plant. Now we've seen how air enters and exits the food and beverage plant. Let's look at the different areas and level of filtration required for these areas. Low care areas, basic hygiene areas, food that in which in essence is food that is unlikely to contain pathogenic microorganisms and will not support the growth due to food characteristics. Examples of this would be fruit and vegetables, grains, cereals, bakeries, alcohol production and storage areas. Pre-filters or first stage filtration consists of filters that are classified EPM coarse. These filters along with cam cleaner will provide sufficient protection for low care areas. Coarse filters come in a range of bag and panel box filters and a with a range of efficiencies available depending on your, your risk assessment needs. Medium care areas, medium hygiene areas. Food that may contact pathogenic microorganisms but will not support their growth due to food characteristics. An example of this are raw material prep, processed and packaged foods, juice production, canned goods, milk products, peanut butter, dried goods filling lines, tipping stations, and meat packaging. The same first stage filtration as basic care areas can be used here. And as Cassie alluded to, at a minimum of final filtration of at least F7 or no, in accordance with the new standard, EPM1 50%. Cam cleaner can also be utilized to improve indoor air quality within the, these areas also. High care areas. This is, a, this is an area where microbiological reduction process is followed by ensuring sufficient air changes. Sandwich productions, salads and ready meats. The same first stage filtration as basic care areas can be utilized here. Second stage filters should again be at a very minimum F7 or EPM1 50%. Final filters should be HEPA and to ensure compliance these filters should comply with EN1822. Your risk assessment will help identify the level of HEPA filtration needed in these areas. High risk areas are high hygiene, which is an area where microbiological prevention process is followed. Sufficient air changes are, are achieved and the area is kept under positive pressure. Examples of this are finished production for human finished products for human consumption, aseptic filling, cooked meats, tasting tasting areas, washing areas, or ice cream production. Same pre-filtration as basic areas should be followed. Second stage filters should again be at very minimum F7 or EPM 150. Final filters in these areas will be HEPA or ULPA, which depends on the application. When it comes to actual filter compliance, the standards for filters that are used in food and beverage industries should be certified ISO 16890 EPM1, certified ISO 846 microbiological growth resistant, certified EC 1935-2004, which is suitable for food contact, certified VDI 6022, fully hygienics for HVAC systems within the F&B industry, 
and free from harmful components such as bisphenol A, phthalates and formaldehydes. This checklist is a guide that can be used to inspect the air handling units for different areas based on requirements for the areas. Notice all the areas have basic requirements of ensuring the air filters are certified to their standards. All belts, bearings and anti-vibration mounts are monitored and maintained as well as ensuring no bypass is created within the air handling unit. In higher quality zones, other checks are needed, such as humidity monitoring, temperature monitoring, and microbiological monitoring. And as you can see, as you can see, we have been so we have separated out in the attached checklist the requirements within each area. Now. I'm going to hand you back to Patrick, who's going to speak to you about indoor air contaminants. Thank you, Ross. If we look at the indoor contaminants, inside the food and beverage plants, there are a lot of different sources of pollution. Some of them you see here, like product ingredients, bacteria, and all from chemicals. The microbial cloud, though, is a very important issue and must be controlled by hygiene, filtration, and overpressure. To test the individual personal cloud, the University of Oregon researchers sequence microbes from the air surrounding 11 different people in sanitized chamber. The study found out that most of the occupants sitting alone in the chamber could be identified within five hours just by the unique combination of bacteria in the surrounding air. Main polluters are actually us. We release 10 million of particles per minute. All humans could be identified through the personal fingerprints of a microbial cloud. Now we look for four reasons for improved indoor air quality. Reduce cross-contamination as an example. Improve product shelf life. Protect, protect employee health. And reduce mold levels. In this case of how to reduce mold growth in the food and the bio-based research complex in Wageningen in Holland. This, this research center has 6,500 employees and 10,000 students. The core areas are food production, health, lifestyle, and living condition. The situation at the research center was microbial contamination in 15 climate rooms for plant breeding. In the picture to the right, we see agar plate samples from the rooms. The result is in CFU, a colony forming unit. This is a unit used to estimate the number of viable bacteria or fungal cells in an air sample. We analyzed number of particles per cubic meter in real time. And the diagram shows the count of particles in that particle size. CFU or mold and fungi samples was also taken. Molds and fungi typically grow slower than bacteria. The spore have a size between 1.5 to 200 microns. Unnormal values of spore is often possible to detect during particle counting in real time. Picture to the left is before an installation. In two samples, we count eight colonies of bacteria before in installation. And the picture to the right shows the result after installation of our air cleaners. In those five samples, we only see two colonies of bacteria. In this particular solution, we use one recirculating air cleaner per room. And the benefits by using this type of product is prevent or reduce contamination of mold and bacteria, manage isoclean room rating or improve the rating. We have patent dual intake, which means two air cleaners in one. We have the certified HEPA filters and very low noise level. Air cleaners from camp have a perfect retrofit or complement existing air handling units. We have six different models that is perfect for creating this type of solution and have an airflow between 300 to 6,000 cubic meters in capacity. 
So, how does it work? The canteen purifies localized air by extracting through a patent double intake, two stage filter system with option for molecular filtration, then resupplying the HEPA filtrated air back into the room. Or if you prefer, you have some type of contaminant or gas, you have the HEPA filter, you have the fan which you extract the air through, and then you will get the clean air. And it is as simple as that. Now we should look into one case of improving product shelf life. The solution for improvement of product shelf life often needs to be tackled in the production facilities. It's often a matter of remove fungus or bacteria from the air, control the air pattern, and increase hygiene and staff awareness. Did you know that ethylene often are common in areas with fruits, plants, and speed up the decomposed process? Consumer often classify dust and product as damaged goods. It's easy to improve air quality in cooling and freezing rooms with recirculating air cleaners. Area of concern for the bread manufacturing company was product shelf life. Main issue was customer complaints with molds before expiring date. The identified contamination source was as follows. No air filtration in the product and packaging area. Shipping area, cooling room, and product packaging area had the same air quality. The packed bread pr production is an open circuit. So the product is actually exposed for, to ambient air. The conclusion was air quality improvement needed, reduce airborne contaminants to get touch with food. As you can see on the picture, the solution for this was two of our industrial systems. In the cooling room, we used recirculating unit with A13 filter and F7 filters. In the packaging area, we use a larger system ducted into an air diffusion sock to spray clean air over the conveyor belt before packaging the bread. With this slide, we'll describe the reduction of particles in the bread packaging area. In the staple diagram, you see the high green staple before installation with a concentration of 95 million particles per cubic meter at the 0.3 micron site. Measurement after installation shows only 100,000 particles per cubic meters at the same particle size. This means a reduction of 99% of the particles in the room and it minimizes the risk of airborne contaminants to get in touch with the bread. With this slide, we'll describe the reduction of particles in the cooling room. In the staple diagram, you see the high green staple before installation with a concentration of 100 million particles per cubic meters at 0.3 micron size. Measurements after installation shows, shows only 1 million particles per cubic meters left. This means a reduction of 99% of the particles in the room and minimize the risk of airborne contaminants to get in touch with the bread. Conclusion, reduction of more than 99% percent of airborne particles increase product shelf life and minimize the risk of airborne cross-contamination. For more information, you can also look at the case study as aircleaner at camphill.com. Particle counts and comparison reports are a service provided by most local camphill offices. Now we should look at protecting employee health. Camphor was approached by a large beverage manufacturer to check the parasitic acid, PAA, levels in a couple of production lines and how we could reduce the level. Reason was eye and skin irritation when production capacity are increasing. PAA are one of several substances often used in antiseptic lines. The level of PAA were taken using a, a ray PID instrument. This takes reading in parts per billion. In the picture to the left, you see the zero, re zero reading at the supply air of the unit. In the diagram, you see the real-time graph of the measurements. 
Initial PA levels was between 10 to 27 ppm in the first hour of monitoring before the trial began. And air cleaning was started. Then the levels dropped by 75% within 25 minutes after switching on the unit. There are several identified safe levels and guidelines in Europe and by EPA in US for those substances. Please take three minutes to watch our customer explain this project in more detail. So my name is Adrian Duckworth. I've been with the company for 19 years. I'm the production manager for three bottling lines and a bottle blowing facility. Uh, we have uh, two carbonated small PET lines and one small aseptic filling line. We also have a bottle blowing facility and there's seven production lines uh, within our business as well. Uh, due to the nature of PAA, which is paracetic acid, which we use to sterilise internal and external uh, packaging of the bottle. Uh, we have a positive airflow system within our filling environment and this does uh, expel some of the fumes uh, and the nature of sensitivity from certain guys that work in that environment um, is at different um, levels. So we um, sought Canfield's assistance in terms of having an air cleaner to minimise the effects on the employees. With certain individuals um, there was quite um, a high level of um, effect from certain fumes within the area and uh, certain people at times have gone off uh, sick where it's um, affected their, their breathing. So the employee health, uh, we have seen a marked improvement and the way we've gleaned that is one through physical data that Canfield have provided for us and also through direct engagement with the crews. So we've asked them their feedback uh, and to see whether it's had positive effects in their working environment. And so far we have had some positive feedback. Uh, Canfield offered that they could give us some hard evidence of data. So they provided the option to use the C6000 air cleaner. So we was able to uh, take readings with the uh, cleaner active and inactive so that we could see what readings we were currently getting through air sampling. And then also once the air cleaner was installed, we then able to get the data of um, the benefits from that being live. I feel the solution uh, has driven some improvements. I do think we're still on a journey to um, being fume free, but I think the uh, air cleaner has definitely provided some benefits and that's really born out of accurate data that we've received from Canfield and also from feedback from the guys that work in that environment. Uh, and we certainly recognise that Canfield are the experts within this field. And that's one of the main reasons we called them in. So for me, uh, we will continue to uh, sustain that relationship uh, and keep it a healthy one so that in the future we are able to continue to work with them when we need them. Yeah, I'd recommend Canfield. Um, they work with data. Uh, they're not emotionally driven. Uh, and I think that uh, the evidence that they provided to us at site um, certainly gave us the confidence to continue uh, the relationship that we have and the fact that they are the experts and that uh, um, they have helped us to drive improvements and this is all born out of working with data. On this picture you find the process version of our unit. It contains 100 kilo molecular media, F7 filter and H14 filter. This product is a unique since it have all these filters, still just the size of a refrigerator and still plug and play and mobile. We have mentioned molecular filter several times in this presentation and this type of filter are used to remove odor smell or hazardous gases. Instead of mechanically filtrate particles, molecular media adsorbs gases and solvents. 
variety of molecular media exist depending on target gas to trap, as you can see in the picture to the left. Just one gram of molecular media have up to 3,000 square meters of surface in a micropore structure, as you can see in the picture in the middle. In the final picture, we see how molecules are trapped in those micropore structures. Remember to always ask for the molecular test standard when considering molecular filtration, because it's also a standard available for that. If we should look at upgrading facilities, in a manufacturing plant, there are a lot of air movement, both uncontrolled and controlled. Air movement could be caused by openings between production and warehouses, in and outload, HVAC system, exhaust system, production equipment, and many more. Air changes requirements are often engineered when building the facility, but not always updated. Addition of new product line, staff, and other processes can add need to new required air changes. Some of the challenges lack of capacity of current HVAC system, no HVAC system in place, need for upgrade zones, medium to high, need to upgrade air pattern, identification of mold and moisture buildup, In a lot of areas, we have air cleaners solution. It's a low cost alter alternative to resizing or relaying existing ductwork and HVAC system. Control of airflow is easy. Dual intake system allows for introduction of air from external sources to maintain positive pressure as required by BRC. Interchangeable filter configuration allows for choice of filters according to risk assessment. As we heard from Cassie earlier, BRC guidelines state the positive airflow in food and beverage facilities. The concept of creating positively pressurized rooms with an air cleaner is to ensure that the air introduced to the room or machine is clean and minimize the risk of contamination. In food production, there is often a need to have overpressure in filling machines, packing machines, water treatment room, syrup room, and many more. In the square box, you see a room within a building and its different air patterns. This picture could also symbolize a production machine. In solution number one, as you can see in the upper left corner of the room, is the internal air cleaner configuration. So you have an air cleaner within the room, it's ducted to the air to the other side of the room or to the outdoor air, and this actually creates the positive pressure, which you can see in the green arrows. In solution number two, as you can see in the right corner, here is the external air cleaning configuration. Then you actually can have an air cleaner on the other side of the wall of a room, make a hole, duct it, and supply the clean HEPA filtrated air into the room. And now we are creating positive pressure. And you can see in the door opening, the green arrow of overpressure released through the door. And now we should look at some potential in saving energy. Filter efficiency vs air changes, one example. If you look at the gray zone, the analyzed area, which have 4,800 cubic meters of air, existing solution had F9 filters, in the existing HVAC unit with 15 air changes. In the examples, we see a theoretical calculation of this, but with different air changes. To the left, you see 15 air changes equal to 72,000 cubic meters for an HVAC unit with F7 filter. In our Clean room program, we calculate the particle steady state of 6.7 million. To the right, you see the same room, but having five air changes, recirculated with an air cleaner with 813 and F7 filters. 
According to those theoretical calculations, we would have a steady state of 5.5 million particles per cubic meters, which is equal in particle numbers for the both cases. That's a huge difference in air changes. Then we in real time measure the room concentration of, of particles per cubic meters at the size of 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 microns, as you can see in the diagram. After 35 minutes, we stopped the HVAC unit and started an air cleaner with five air changes marked with this green line. When running the air cleaner for one hour, we now reach only 1.5 million of particles instead of 8 million of particles. And this is approximately a reduction of 80% of particles. So the conclusion here is with 15 air changes, we reach 8 million particles. And with five air changes of the room volume, we reach 1.5 million. Filter madness and what a huge potential in energy savings. If the source of pollutants are inside a building, it's most of the time more energy efficient to recyclate it locally. A lot of countries have minus degrees during winter time or hot during summer time. In this example, we could have 10 to 20 times higher, higher energy consumption during, for example, a cold period of six months. This is, a, of course, depending on the circumstances and in temperature and efficiency of the heat exchanger and the number of air changes. With five pieces of air cleaner with an airflow of 24,000 cubic meter, we consumed only 14,000 kilowatt hours. But when using 15 air shedding air changes, we should consume 140,000 to 300,000 kilowatt hours by doing that. Monitoring and controlling indoor air quality. Our image is a sensor system that monitors your indoor air quality. It raises and lowers the operation level of your air cleaner, depending on the amount of particles in the air, saving your energy in precise increased protection for people and equipment. The sensor also works as a standalone without connection to the air cleaner. And some of the benefits is easy to install, low cost, no wiring needed, indoor air quality control, real-time and historical data reading, and an alarm in user interface for filter replacement, and energy savings. Fan speed increase only during high particle peaks. So when it comes to, to the conclusion, I think we will add in ROS to this also. So throughout this webinar, we've discussed the growing importance of air quality to the food and beverage industry. By protecting the air that is in your facility, you are protecting your products, your processes, and your people. Food and beverage plants have stringent air quality standards in place with the likes of BRC. Do they go far enough? The first step in achieving these standards is to choose products that are tested and certified to the industry standards to ensure compliance with your audits. Super. And then we come to the point with the questions and, and answers. Yes, well, thank you so much for that really interesting presentation, um, Ross, Patrick, and of course, Cassie. Uh, before we move on to the live Q&A session, can I invite those of you um, joining us to provide us with some feedback on today's webinar? In a moment, a poll will appear on your screen asking you to rate the webinar. And if you could just take a moment to provide us with your feedback, it would be much appreciated. OK, so let's now move on to our Q&A session where today's speakers will endeavor to tackle all your queries. Right, um, team, here comes your first question. And I don't know who's going to tackle it. Do you feel the BRC guidelines are strong enough? 
currently. Shall I go for that first? Yes, please, Kathy. Um, personally, uh, I think they could be better. I think it would be helpful if there was more detail, especially in the interpretation guide, to give sites uh, the detail that they need to be able to apply the clause more effectively. However, although it is just one clause, there are all the elements needed within that clause um, to produce a non-conformance, if you like, if you're not adhering to it completely. Um, so although it's not detailed in terms of how you should comply, if you're not complying, there is a risk um, of not getting of getting sorry a, a nonconformance within that clause because it does actually require filtration and it talks about high risk areas and positive air pressure and that it all needs to be documented within a risk assessment. So although it could be better, I think that it's sufficient at this stage. Okay, so always room for improvement, but good enough at the moment. Okay, so yep. next, um, how can I assess the effectiveness of the air filter and measure the air quality after passing through the filter? Is there any tool or instrument, etc., that I could use? Who's taking that one? It's Ross here. I'll take that. As Patrick showed on the presentation, we have an air image sensor that we can install and verify the efficiencies of the filters and that they're performing to standards. So that's a very simple tool to apply within a facility to ensure that the quality of air is meeting the standards. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And if 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 required, you could do in situ test also over a filter within an HVAC unit, for example. Good. Okay. Um... How do I know if my HVAC system is providing enough clean air? I mean, Sorry. yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, for me, it's two different ways. One thing is what is the quality inside the room and what is actually the quality supplied through the HVAC unit. Uh, I mean, one thing is the filter in the HVAC unit and should be according to standard and reach the desired level, then of course we should discuss what is the desired level. <laughs> is it F7, which is kind of 50% of the particles filtrated, or is it in a HEPA filter that actually stops E. coli, for example? Mm. I don't know if that was good enough as an, as an answer. And I think okay. from my point of view, it's important to make sure that we're using things like air plates. So we can actually prove through data from a micro perspective that the air quality is right. Yeah, okay. I totally agree. absolutely. Okay, so all about having solid evidence. Okay, um, you mentioned glass fiber filters. Is this damaging to my food product? Who's going to take that one? I can take that. Absolutely not. Um, glass fiber poses absolutely no risk to the process within a food and beverage application at all. We have our materials certified to EC 9035 2004, which means that they're suitable for food contact. So they are completely safe with, for use within the food and beverage industry. Good, very reassuring to know. Um, rattling on, because I'm delighted to say we've got a number of questions. Uh, is there a service to get my factory checked for air quality? Yes, there is. We have a service called Air Care where we can come out to your facility and survey, survey the facility and report back the air quality and the equipment quality so that it is provided to, to show that whether it's compliant or non-compliant. So that is a service Campbell can provide. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, and clearly, guidelines are a pressing issue for our um, webinar delegates. What other global guidelines should I be aware of? Who's going to take that one? BRC typically is. Oh, sorry, Cassie, do you want to take that? Uh, I can do. Yeah. Like you were going to say, probably BRC is the one that's got the most detail in it. Um, but it is a GFSI recognized scheme, and there are other, there are other GFSI recognized schemes like SQF, IFS, 
um, FSSC 22000 and so on. But um, although those standards do require uh, good quality air, they don't provide as much detail as the BRC does. Okay. So BRC, but other guidelines are available. Um, okay. Uh, and oh yeah, here's one about post filtering. After filtering, what about the filtered particles? What happens there? I I I assume they're asking about uh, particle sh particle shedding. Um, that doesn't happen. Um, from non-shedding particles or non-shedding filter material, so there should not be there should not be any uh, particle shedding from the filters, so there would not be any risk of that. I think they might be asking when the uh, filters are working and it takes the particles out of the air, where do they go? Oh, they're captured within the filter media. So basically, as the air passes through the filter media, the particles are captured within the fibers, the fine fibers within the filter within the filter media. Okay, interesting stuff. And uh, getting specific here, what class of filter would you recommend for a hatchery? Any suggestions? I would say I I would recommend at very minimum an EPM EPM one fifty percent at very minimum for a hatchery. Because I mean, what sort of conditions are we talking about there that need to be taken into consideration? Ultimately, what you what you the conditions you're talking about is the indoor air quality. So you want to provide them with an acceptable level. Of, of indoor air quality for the hatchery in itself. So you want to provide at a very minimum an acceptable level in accordance with the BRC standards for the PM150% filter. Okay. So all the time it's about adhering to standards, of course. Um, right. Well, great question to end on. Um, obviously, there's been a really good response to your comments. So People are asking, this isn't that you we've had several people asking, is it possible to get the presentations via email? Or just have a copy of your presentations today? Do you think that will be possible? Yes, I think they will be possible out right. after the webinar. Recording. These are, this webinar is actually recorded also so people can view it back uh, online. So they'll have it they'll have a video recording of it for reference. Sure. So you can come back in your own in your own time when it suits you and listen once again to all the excellent expert advice we've had. So we're running out of time, so I think it's a good point to wrap up. Um so for all our webinar delegates, thanks again so much for joining us. Um and uh, we very much hope to have you with us again, but let's just finish by Please join me in thanking Patrick Janssen, Ross Dummigan, and Cathy Marsh for their time today. And from all of us at New Food and from Camphill, thanks so much for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>